The reading is from the life of our Father among the Saints, John the Merciful, Patriarch of Alexandria. This is from Leontius, Bishop of Neopolis, and from Metaphrastes. He is commemorated on the twelfth day of the month of November. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. St. John was born on the island of Cyprus and was the son of Prince Epiphanios. He was reared well, and the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, was rooted in his heart. When he reached manhood, he was compelled by his parents to take a wife and begot children, but first his children died, and then his wife, for it was pleasing to God that John be freed from bondage to things of the flesh and that he devote himself to the spiritual life. John thanked God for this freedom, and from that time forth, delivered of all hindrance, began to labor more zealously for the Lord. He exercised himself in frequent prayer and in every God-pleasing work, and was especially compassionate to all who suffered from poverty. God glorified him among men on account of his virtues, and he was held in honor and revered not only by his equals, but by the emperor as well. When the patriarchal throne of Alexandria was vacant, the emperor Heraclius appointed John to fill it. Although John did not desire the rank of patriarch, he was forced to accept consecration, becoming the pastor of the church of Alexandria. As he began to shepherd Christ's rational sheep, John's first concern was to cleanse his flock of heresy, which greatly troubled it at that time because a man named Peter had dared to insert blasphemous words into the thrice holy hymn, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. Before the words have mercy on us, he added, Who was crucified for us, as though our Lord's divinity had suffered. Having uprooted this blasphemous heresy, St. John devoted himself to the fulfillment of God's commandments and the care of the poor. He permitted no one to depart from him disappointed, but gave alms to everyone who asked of him. He comforted all who sorrowed, not only by words, but by deeds as well. The hungry he fed, the naked he clothed. He ransomed captives out of bondage and cared for the ill and for strangers. His generosity was like a river which flowed abundantly and without ceasing, and the thirst of all who drank from it was quenched. At the beginning of his reign, John summoned the stewards of the patriarchate and gave them this command. Go through the entire city and make a list of all who are my lords. The stewards asked him, And who, O master, are your lords? Answered the patriarch, Those whom you call the poor are my lords, for it is they who can prepare a dwelling place for me in eternity and assist me greatly to attain my salvation. The stewards wrote down the names of all the paupers they found on the streets, in the hospitals, and on the dunghills. The poor numbered 7,500, and St. John ordered that each day they be given what was necessary for their sustenance from the treasury of the church. At that time, the Persians conquered Syria, burned the holy city of Jerusalem, took the sacred wood of the cross, and led away many Christians into captivity. The blessed John sent ships loaded with wheat and gold to ransom the captives and to aid those beset by misfortune. In his compassion he freed numerous prisoners from captivity, thus delivering them from the woes of slavery. Since many who hoped to speak with the saint were disappointed, for his servants did not inform him, he set aside two days in each week, Wednesday and Friday, when he sat by the doors of his church with certain honorable men, admitting into his presence whoever wished to be heard. He received petitions, judged the disputes which arose between the brethren, gave assistance to those who had suffered offense, and made peace among men. Concerning this, the holy patriarch said to his clergy, If I always have unhindered access to my Lord and God and can ask of him whatsoever I wish, how can I not permit my brother to have ready access to me, allowing him to tell me when he has suffered offense or is in need and to ask me for that which he requires? We ought to fear him who said, With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Whenever it happened that no one came to the Blessed One to make a request as he sat by the doors of the church, he would rise with tears in his eyes, returning much saddened to his house. Should someone ask him why he grieved, he would answer them, The lowly John has found nothing to offer unto God for his sins. 
On such occasions, his friend, the blessed Sophronius, would attempt to console him, saying, Truly, you ought to rejoice today, Father, for your flock lives in peace, without disagreements and troubles like the angels of God. One day, the stewards of the church told John that certain well-dressed maidens stood among the poor, beseeching alms, and asked whether they ought to give alms to them as to the poor. The patriarch replied, If you are true servants of Christ and servants of the lowly John, give to them as Christ commanded, and do not consider their appearance. Make no inquiry concerning the manner of life of those who beseech alms of you. It is not our own wealth that we distribute, but Christ's. Therefore, let us dispense it as he wishes. If you imagine that the church's wealth will not suffice to permit a generous distribution, I will have no portion with your unbelief. I believe that God would not permit the church's treasury to be emptied even if the poor from the entire world were to come to Alexandria begging alms of us. Then, hoping to strengthen the steward's faith, John told them this tale. When I was fifteen years old and still lived in Cyprus, an exceedingly fair maiden, clad in brilliant apparel and wearing a wreath made of leaves on her head, appeared to me one night in a dream. She stood by my bed, touched my side, and awoke me, and I saw her no longer in a dream, but openly. I asked her who she was and how she dared come to me as I slept. Her eyes were joyful and her countenance radiant, and she answered me with a modest smile. I am the eldest and foremost daughter of the great king. Hearing this, I fell down before her. Then she continued, If you gain me as your friend, I shall intercede with the king for you, asking that he bestow upon you much grace. I shall usher you into his presence, for no one has greater boldness before him than I. It was I who brought him down from heaven to the earth and caused him to be clothed in human flesh. So saying, the maiden disappeared. I marveled at this wondrous vision and said to myself, Truly it was compassion which appeared to me under the guise of a maiden, as was shown by the olive wreath she wore, for the olive is the symbol of compassion. The maiden's words also testify to the same, for she said, It was I who, wrought, who brought God down from heaven to the earth and caused him to be clothed in human flesh. Truly it was compassion which moved the Creator to deliver man from perdition. He bowed the heavens out of compassion, wishing to have mercy upon his creation. Therefore, should one hope to obtain God's mercy, it is above all necessary to show mercy on one's neighbors and to bestow alms on them. Pondering these thoughts, I arose and hastened to church alone, for the day was already dawning. On the way, I met a naked beggar, trembling from the cold. I removed my outer garment and gave it to him, saying to myself, now I shall learn whether the vision I beheld was true or a delusion. Even before reaching the church, I was met by a man clad in white garments who gave me a pouch containing a hundred pieces of silver. He said, Take this, friend. I took it gladly, although I quickly repented of what I had done, for I did not need the money. I turned about to return it, but the man was nowhere to be found, although I searched for him diligently. Then I understood that the vision I had seen was no delusion but was true. After this I often desired to know, when I distributed alms, whether God would reward me a hundredfold, and on the many occasions when I tried the matter, I found it to be so. Finally I said to myself, Cease tempting the Lord your God, O my soul. One day, while the saint was visiting the sick, which he did twice or thrice every week, he came upon a stranger who begged alms of him. The patriarch commanded his servants to give the man six pieces of silver. After receiving the coins, the stranger departed. However, since he wished to test the saint's generosity, he changed his garment, took another street, again met the blessed John, and begged him, Have mercy on me, my lord, for I am a captive. John once more commanded that the man be given six pieces of silver, but one of the servants whispered in his ear, Master, this is the poor man who took the other six coins. The patriarch pretended not to hear the servant, and again ordered that the supplicant be given money. After the stranger had received alms the second time, he changed his clothes once more, approached the patriarch, and again asked alms of him. The servant said to the patriarch, Master, this man has already taken six pieces of silver twice, and now asks for alms a third time. The Blessed One then said to the servant, Give him twelve pieces of silver, for perhaps he is Christ and wishes to test me. 
There was a merchant who lost his wealth in a shipwreck and was reduced to poverty, and in his extreme want, want asked the saint for assistance. The saint gave him five pounds of gold, and there are seventy-two gold coins to a pound. The man took the gold, bought numerous wares, loaded them in a ship, and then set sail to sell them in other cities. But a storm arose, once more sending all that he possessed to the bottom of the sea, and the man succeeded in saving only himself from the waters. He returned to St. John and told him everything which had befallen him, and John said to him, You had other gold coins that you acquired dishonestly, and you mixed them with the church's gold which I gave you. Because of this you lost both the one and the other. Then the saint gave the merchant ten pounds of gold, twice as much as before, but all the merchant's wares were lost in a third shipwreck, and he did not dare appear before the patriarch again. He sat at home and lamented, sprinkling ashes on his head, and wished to put an end to his life. When the saint learned of this, he summoned the merchant and said to him, Why have you fallen into despair? Trust in God, and he will not forsake you. I believe that this has befallen you because you acquired your ship dishonestly. The saint then commanded that the man be given one of the church's ships filled with wheat and dismissed him. The merchant set sail, but suddenly a strong wind arose which drove the ship to a distant land. The merchant saw a vision in which St. John the Merciful stood at the helm, guiding his ship, and he took heart, trusting that by the saint's prayers the journey would come to a happy end. When the ship had sailed for twenty days and twenty nights, it touched shore on the coast of Britain. There was a great famine in that country, and when the inhabitants learned that a ship filled with wheat had arrived, they rejoiced greatly and began to buy grain. The merchant sold the wheat for a good price, taking half of his payment in gold and half in pure tin. On its return, the ship put in at Decapolis, where the merchant hoped to sell the tin, but he found that it had turned to gold. The merchant returned in great joy to Alexandria and told everyone of the wondrous miracle by which his wealth had been restored to him through the prayers of St. John and the alms of the patriarch that the patriarch had given him. One day, while the saint was on his way to church, he was approached by a nobleman who had lost all his wealth to robbers. The patriarch felt compassion for him, for he was an honorable man, held in high repute, and had suddenly fallen from great wealth to utter, uh, utter poverty. John whispered to one of his servants to tell the stewards of the church to give the man fifteen pounds of gold, but the stewards saw that there was little in the treasury, so they disobeyed the patriarch's command. Instead, they gave the man only five pounds. As the holy patriarch was returning to his house, a wealthy woman, greatly esteemed by all, approached him and gave him a sheet of paper on which she had written that she vowed to give five hundred pounds of gold to the church. When the patriarch read this, he perceived by the Holy Spirit who dwelt within him that the woman had intended to give more than she now promised. This God permitted because the stewards had not given the impoverished nobleman fifteen pounds of gold as the saint had commanded. After returning to his house, the patriarch summoned the stewards and asked them how much they had given the man whose wealth was stolen. They lied, saying, Fifteen pounds of gold as you commanded, master. The saint upbraided them for their deceit, greed, and disobedience, saying to them, May God deprive you of a thousand pounds of gold, a pious woman intended to give us fifteen hundred pounds of gold, but you disobeyed me and withheld ten pounds from the man who was in need, so God caused her to withhold a thousand pounds. You do not believe me, but you will soon learn the truth of what I say. St. John then sent his servants to summon that generous woman. When she arrived, he asked her in the presence of the stewards, Tell us, for love's sake, my lady, how many pounds of gold did God put into your heart to give to his church? The woman understood that she could not conceal her thoughts from the saint, and said, Truly, Master, a few days ago I wrote on a sheet of paper that I intended to entrust fifteen hundred pounds of gold into your sacred hands. But several days later, when I unfolded the sheet of paper, I found that somehow the words one thousand had been scraped away and only the five hundred remained. Therefore the thought came to me that it was not God's will that I give your holiness more than five hundred pounds, and I held back the rest. 
The stewards were filled with fear and shame and fell at the saints' feet, begging forgiveness. At that time, a multitude of people fled to Alexandria before the invading Persians, and a terrible famine ensued. St. John fed a host of starving people and spent all the money in the treasury of the church, which even fell a thousand pounds of gold into debt. Now a certain clergyman had remarried after the death of his first wife and was deprived of his rank. This man wrote to the patriarch, I possess a great deal of wheat, which I wish to give to Christ through your hands. Moreover, I vow to give a hundred and fifty pounds of gold to the church, if only you will consent to make me a deacon. The saint summoned the former clergyman to upbraid him for the sin of simony. He said to him, Confess your sin and fear the punishment which befell Gehazi. God is perfectly able to feed us in the day of hunger without your help. Even as the patriarch spoke, messengers arrived with word that two of the church's ships had returned from Sicily, laden with wheat. Hearing this, the patriarch fell to his knees and thanked God who never forsakes those who trust in him. It is fitting that we speak now of St. John's meekness, humility, and freedom from rancor. Two clergymen were punished for wrongdoing by excommunication from the church for a time. One of them repented of his sin, but the other became embittered, grew angry at the patriarch, and fell deeper into iniquity than before. Learning of this, the patriarch wished to summon the man to calm him with kind words and to exhort him to lay aside his anger. But he forgot his intention to do this, for it was God's will that John's humility be made manifest more clearly so that all might be edified. Sometime after this, while the saint was serving the bloodless sacrifice on a feast day, he remembered the clergyman who was angry with him and also the words of Christ written in the gospel. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath wrought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. He stepped back from the altar, called for the clergyman, and when he arrived, fell at his feet, asking forgiveness. Seeing the patriarch humble himself, the cleric was filled with remorse and fell at the saint's feet, likewise asking forgiveness. After he had thus reconciled the clergyman, John returned to the altar, boldly completing the sacrifice, and was able with a clear conscience to repeat the words, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Moreover, the cleric corrected himself and began to live in a manner pleasing to God. Later he was again deemed worthy of the priestly rank. St. John showed similar humility when a commoner, a citizen of Alexandria, cursed and reviled his nephew, whose name was George. George came to his uncle, the blessed John, and with tears in his eyes told him of the man who had shown him disrespect. The patriarch saw that his nephew, nephew was incensed and wished to console him and to calm his wrath, pretended to be angry with the man with whom his nephew had quarreled. He said, How could that boar have dared to show disrespect for the son of my beloved sister? May God be my witness that I will repay him in such a manner that all Alexandria shall marvel at what I have done. George was somewhat quieted by these words. He became calmer and ceased to weep. Then the truly meek and humble John said, Beloved son, if you wish to be called my nephew, be prepared to endure not only insults but even wounds, and to forgive your neighbor all things for God's sake. A man is not noble because of his ancestry, for the only true nobility is that which is gained through virtue. The boast of true nobility is not the renown of a man's ancestors, but his own good deeds and a way of life pleasing to God. St. John then summoned the official who oversaw the properties of the church. The man who had reviled George lived in a house owned by the church, so the saint told the steward not to collect the rent due from him for an entire year, but to allow him to live in the house free of charge. Thus did John repay the man in a manner that caused all of Alexandria to marvel, just as he had said, for instead of punishing him, the saint became his benefactor. The blessed John wished always to keep the remembrance of death in his thoughts. Therefore he commanded that a coffin be made for him but not completed. He also instructed the carpenters to come to him on every feast day and to say in the presence of all, Master, 
your coffin has still not been completed. Command that it be finished, for death comes like a thief at an hour unbeknown to all. Thus did St. John preserve the remembrance of death and prepare to meet the hour of his departure. One day a rich nobleman came to visit the saint and saw that the saint's bed was covered with a blanket of the poorest quality. Returning to his home, he sent John a quilt valued at thirty-six pieces of silver and begged him to cover himself with it. The patriarch did not wish to offend the nobleman, so he took the quilt but slept beneath it only one night. Then he began to say to himself, Woe unto you, John, you wretch, for you sleep beneath a costly quilt, while Christ's brethren, the poor, lie stiff in the cold. How many of them have no home or shelter and pass the night in the wind and frost with only tatters and a little straw mat to cover them? How many of them lie naked upon dunghills trembling from the cold? They have nothing to eat. Hunger keeps them awake through the night and they perish in the cold. Woe is me. How many are the paupers who wish that, like Lazarus, they could eat the crumbs which fall from my table? Woe is me. How many wanderers and strangers walk the streets of this city with no place to lay their heads? Every sort of misfortune befalls them while they sleep on the streets, but they endure everything and thank Christ. And you, O John, wish to enjoy eternal repose, although you live sumptuously and without cares, possessing every convenience. You live, you live in a beautiful palace, Wear soft clothing, drink wine, eat the finest fish, and now cover yourself with a costly quilt. What reward do you hope to receive in the age to come? Truly I say to you, John, you wretch, you shall not enter the eternal kingdom, but will hear the words once spoken to the rich man in the gospel, Thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, while the poor have received evil. May God be my witness that the lowly John will not cover himself for another night with this quilt, and will use the price of it to comfort the poor. The first thing next morning, the saint sent the quilt to the market to be sold, intending with the price to purchase clothing for the poor. While the quilt was being displayed, the nobleman who had given it to the blessed John happened to pass by. He saw it, bought it again, and sent it back to John with the request that the saint keep it for his own needs. The saint accepted it, and then send it back to be sold. The nobleman again saw it in the marketplace, purchased it, and sent it to John, entreating him to use it himself. John sent it a third time to the market, but the merchant bought it once again and sent it back to John. Then, then John sent this message to the nobleman, Let us see who first grows weary, I, selling the quilt, or you, purchasing and returning it to me. In this way, St. John acquired much gold from that man for the needs of the poor. The Blessed One knew well how to lure the avaricious into giving alms and how to teach the mercenary to love the poor. One day he took a certain bishop, Trelis, or Troilus, whom he knew to be extremely miserly, to a hospital to visit the poor and the sick. When he saw that Troilus had gold, the saint said to him, Father Troilus, an excellent opportunity has presented itself for you to give alms and to comfort our poor brethren. Troilus had no desire to give alms, but not wishing to appear greedy, he gave money to all, from the first to the last. He distributed thirty pounds of gold and then began to regret what he had done. He returned home and lay down on his bed, lamenting and sorrowing. Meanwhile, John sent a messenger to him, inviting him to supper, but Troilus sent back word that he was ill and did not go. John perceived the cause of Troilus's illness, so he took thirty pounds of gold and went to visit the sick man. Entering Troilus's room, John said to him, I have brought you the gold which I borrowed from you at the hospital. You may take it, but I ask that you write a letter with your own hand, giving me the recompense with which the Lord would have rewarded you for your almsgiving. Seeing the gold, Troilus rejoiced and took it. His recovery followed at once, and he sat up to write the following, O merciful God, give the reward for the thirty pounds of gold which I distributed to the poor to my Lord John, Patriarch of Alexandria, who has returned my money to me. John took the sheet of paper from Troilus and then returned with him to his own house, where they ate supper. 
While eating, John secretly prayed to God, asking him to free Troilus from the passion of avarice. And that very night, Troilus beheld in a dream an exceedingly beautiful house, the splendor of which cannot be described. This inscription was written in letters of gold on the doors, the eternal dwelling place of Bishop Troilus. Troilus rejoiced to see that such a fair abode had been reserved for him. But suddenly an awesome and august man appeared, clad in the attire of an imperial chamberlain. This man said to his servants, The Lord of all the earth has commanded that the inscription above these doors be removed. And without delay the servants effaced it. Then he appeared again and said to the servants, Write the following upon the doors. The eternal dwelling place of John, Archbishop of Alexandria, who purchased it for thirty pounds of gold. Troilus awoke from sleep, full of fear and sorrow, because he had lost his abode in heaven. Reproaching himself for his greed, he arose from his bed and hastened to tell the blessed John what he had seen. St. John said many things to console and instruct him, and from that time forth Troilus corrected himself, became a lover of the poor, and showed compassion to all. Once the blessed John was deprived of much wealth in the following manner. A number of the church's ships, laden with numerous wares, were sailing the Adriatic Sea when a storm broke and strong winds arose. God permitted the ships and everything in them to sink, so that St. John's faith might be tried and shown to be much more precious than gold that perisheth. The ships numbered thirteen, and the wares they were carrying were valued at thirty-three hundred pounds of gold. St. John suffered the loss with gratitude to God, even though the prophet he expected the voyage to bring him would have permitted him to feed and clothe the poor for a long time, and he frequently repeated the words of Job, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Many of the chief citizens came to console him in his sorrow. But he said to them, It is I who am the cause of the church's loss. For had I not exalted myself, enjoying the thought that I gave much alms to the poor, the church would not have suffered such a great loss. I have grown proud, although it is not my own wealth that I distribute but God's. Therefore God, wishing to humble me, has permitted me to fall into poverty. Moreover, I am guilty of causing others to suffer want, for the poor have lost their sustenance and shall now endure hunger because of me. Nevertheless, the Lord will not forsake them. He will grant them all that they need, not for my sake, but because of their plight. Thus those who came to comfort John were themselves consoled by his edifying words. John continued to bestow abundant alms upon the poor and was especially generous to those who had suffered offense. Once, while he was on his way to the church of the holy martyrs, Cyrus and John, a widow approached him, told him how he had been wronged by her brother-in-law and asked for his assistance. Those who were accompanying the holy patriarch said to him, Master, let us hear the widow's request after we return home. But the saint replied, How can I expect God to hearken unto me now if I will not hear her? And he did not continue on his way until he had heard her complaint and promised to protect her. There was a young man who was left in poverty after the death of his parents. John knew that they had been very wealthy, so he asked those present how it was that the youth had fallen into such want. Certain pious men related to him that the youth's parents were very generous and had given all their possessions to the poor, leaving for their son only ten pounds of gold. First his mother died, and then his father drew near death. He summoned his son, and placing before him the gold and an icon of the most pure Theotokos, said, Beloved son, behold, only ten pounds of gold remain in our possession, for we have entrusted all the rest into Christ's hands. Now tell me, what do you prefer, I leave you, this gold or the image of Our Lady the Theotokos, your protectress and nourisher? The youth refused the gold which he asked to be given to the needy, and instead took the icon of the most pure Theotokos. Thus the family's last money was given to the poor. The father then died, and the young man remained a pauper, enduring great suffering because of his poverty. Nevertheless, he went day and night to the services at the church of the most pure and holy Theotokos. When the blessed John heard report of this, he marveled, of the virtue and wisdom of the youth, 
and felt in his soul great love for him. From that time the true father of orphans kept the youth in mind and considered how he might benefit him. At length he summoned one of the stewards and said to him, There is something I wish to tell you, but take care that you speak of it to no one. The steward promised to keep the secret, so the patriarch continued, Take an old sheet of paper and draw up a will on the name of one Theopemptus. Write in it that I am the close relative of the impoverished young man, and tell the youth, Brother, do you not know that you are the patriarch's relative? There is no need for you to remain here and suffer in poverty. Then show him the testament and say, Child, if you are ashamed to go to the patriarch and to tell him that you are his relative, I will do so. The steward did as the patriarch told him. He wrote out the will and, summoning the young man, told him that he had found among his father's documents a will declaring the youth's ties of kinship with the patriarch. The young man rejoiced when he read it, but at the same time could not help but feel shame, for he was very poor and clad in rags. Therefore he begged the steward to go to the patriarch and to speak on his behalf. When the steward returned to the patriarch, the saint said to him, Tell the youth that the patriarch said to you, I know that my uncle had a son, but I have never seen him. You would do well to bring him and the will to me. The steward brought the youth to St. John, who received him warmly, warmly and said, It is good that you have come, for you are certainly the son of my uncle. The saint gave the youth a home, possessions, and everything he lacked, and then wed him to a maiden of noble birth. He also endowed him with wealth, so that he was held in esteem by all, and the words of the psalm were fulfilled, I have not seen the righteous man forsake him, nor his seed begging bread. St. John felt compassion for the ill, whom he frequently served with his own hands. He was accustomed to sit beside the dying and to ease their departure by his prayers. He often served the divine liturgy for the reposed, saying that when the sacred liturgy was celebrated for the dead, their souls received much aid. To confirm this, the saint told the following tale concerning the things which had befallen a family in Cyprus. There was a man from Cyprus whom the Persians took captive and clapped in heavy iron shackles. His parents were told that he had perished, and they lamented for him as though he were dead. Thrice yearly they had the divine liturgy served on his behalf and brought gifts to the church in commemoration of his soul. Four years later their son escaped from captivity and returned home. Seeing him, his parents were astonished supposing that he had risen from the dead. They rejoiced greatly because he had gained his freedom and told him that they had commemorated him thrice every year. Their son asked them, On what days did you commemorate me? They replied, On Theophany, Pascha, and Pentecost. When he heard this, he told his parents that on those days a man of comely appearance would enter his cell in the prison carrying a candle and that the fetters would fall from his feet. Throughout the rest of the year, however, he was held in shackles. The blessed John took great care to judge no one as a sinner, especially if he was a monk, because once he fell into sin by judging a monk under the following circumstances. A youthful monk came to Alexandria in the company of a young and very beautiful maiden, spending several days there. Certain persons noticed them and were scandalized, supposing them to be guilty of fornication, and told the holy patriarch John of this. He ordered that the strangers be seized, beaten severely, and locked in prison apart from one another. When night fell, the monk appeared to the patriarch in a dream, showed him the wounds he bore upon his shoulders from the merciless flogging he had suffered, and said to him, Does the sight of this please you, master? Is it thus that you have learned to feed the flock of Christ, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly? The apostle says, Believe me, you as a man have been led astray. After saying this, the monk disappeared. The patriarch awoke from sleep and began to ponder the vision. He understood that he had sinned and sat upon his bed, grieving and lamenting. The next morning he commanded that the monk be brought before him. 
With great difficulty, the monk came, for he could scarcely move on account of his many stripes. When the patriarch laid eyes on him, he fell at once into a stupor. After about an hour, he came to himself and asked the monk to remove his garment and to show him his shoulders, so that he could see whether his wounds were like those of the monk he beheld in his dream. He did so, and by chance exposed his private parts. All those present saw that he was a eunuch, but because he was young, no one had recognized him as such until then. The patriarch saw that his body was covered with wounds and was very sorry for what had occurred. He sent for those who had slandered the monk and excommunicated them for three years. Then he asked the monk for forgiveness, saying to him, Forgive me, my brother, for what I have done to you out of ignorance. I have sinned both before you and God. Nevertheless, it is not proper that you should go about the city with a maiden, scandalizing the lady, for you wear the monastic schema. The monk answered him humbly, Believe me, master, I do not lie but speak the truth. Some time ago, while I was still in Gaza, I went to venerate the sepulchre of the holy martyrs Cyrus and John. It was evening when I met the maiden who fell at my feet and begged me with tears to permit her to accompany me. I turned and fled, but she ran after me, saying, I entreat you by the God of Abraham, who came down to save sinners, and who shall judge both the living and the dead, not to forsake me. Hearing this, I said to her, Why do you speak thus, O maiden? With tears in her eyes, she replied, I am a Jewess, and wish to abandon the evil faith of my forefathers and become a Christian. Therefore I beseech you, Father, not to forsake me, but save the soul of one who wishes to believe in Christ. At this I feared God's judgment. So I took her with me and instructed her in the holy faith. When we reached the sepulchre of the holy martyrs, I baptized her in the church there, and have since continued to travel with her in simplicity of heart. It is my intent to take her to a convent for virgins. The patriarch sighed and said, How many are the hidden servants of God of whom we, the wretched ones, know nothing? The saint then told those present about the dream he beheld the night before and took one hundred pieces of gold with the intention of giving them to the monk. But the monk did not wish to take even a single coin, saying, If a monk has faith that God cares for him, he has no need for gold, and if he loves gold, he does not believe in God. So saying, he bowed down before the patriarch and departed. From that time forth, the blessed John began to revere all monks greatly, both the good and those who seemed to live an evil life. He built a monastery which served as a guest house for traveling monks and carefully guarded himself from judging others. This good shepherd also taught his sheep not to dare to condemn anyone and to give heed to their own transgressions rather than those of others, even if they were certain that another had sinned. Once a certain youth fled to Constantinople from Alexandria with a nun, and all condemned him, saying, He has brought about the damnation of two souls, his own and the nun's. Moreover, he has scandalized all men, for it is written, Woe to that man by whom offense cometh. St. John said to them, Children, do not judge him, for doing this you make yourselves guilty of two sins. Your first sin is that you transgress God's commandment by condemning your brother, for it is written, Judge nothing before the time. Your second is that you slander your brother, for you do not know whether he still continues to sin or if he has already repented. Then he told them the following tale. There was a monk who was walking through the streets of Tyre, a notorious whore of that city whose name was Porphyria, caught sight of him. She began to follow the monk and to call out to him, Save me, Father, as Christ saved the harlot. Overcoming natural shame, he replied, Follow me, and took her by the hand, leading her out of the city and the sight of all. Word spread throughout the city that the monk had taken the harlot, Porphyria, to become his wife. The monk took her to a convent, and on the way she found an abandoned infant, which she took to rear as though it were her own child. Sometime thereafter, citizens of Tyre happened to be in the region where that monk and Porphyria had lived. When they saw that she had a child, they mocked her, saying, Well done, Porphyria. Returning to Tyre, these persons told everyone, Porphyria has borne the child of the monk. 
We have seen him with our own eyes, and he resembles the monk in every way. Presently the monk foresaw that his end was near. He said to Pelagia, for that was the name of Porphyria, that she took when she became a nun, Let us go to Tyre, for there is a matter to which I must attend there, and I wish you to come with me. Pelagia did not dare disobey, so she went with him. They were accompanied by the child, who now was seven years old. When they reached the city, the elder fell ill, and many of the citizens came to visit him. He told them, Bring me a censer, which they did. The monk took a live coal from the censer and placed it upon his breast, where he left it until it died out. The coal burned neither his flesh nor his garment, and he cried, Blessed is God who once kept the bush unburnt by the fire. He is my witness, that even as this burning coal has neither scorched my flesh nor touched my garment, so I have remained a stranger to sins of the flesh from the day I was born. With that the elder surrendered his soul into the hands of the Lord. Those who beheld this marveled, glorifying God, who indeed has many hidden servants. When John finished the story, he told the people, Therefore, my brethren and children, do not be quick to judge. Even when we see the transgression, we may not see the secret repentance. As the good pastor was thus guiding the church of Christ and instructing his rational sheep, the Persians attacked the city of Alexandria, and the patriarch was compelled to sail to Constantinople, in accordance with the words of the scriptures, when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. While on the journey he fell ill, and a man holding a golden scepter appeared to him and said, The king of kings summons you. From this the saint understood that his end was near. He reached Cyprus, his homeland, but could continue no further. He remained in Amathus, the city where he was born, and there reposed in peace. As he lay dying, he prayed thus, I thank thee, O Lord my God, because thou hast permitted me to return to thee what is thine, and because I am left with no earthly possessions except for a single piece of silver, and even this will be given to the poor. When I was made bishop of Alexandria, I found eight thousand pounds of gold in the patriarchate's treasury. I collected many more thousands which were brought in offering by those who love God. All this I have given to thee, O Christ, unto whom I now commit my spirit. The saint was buried in Amathus in the church of St. Tikon, between the bodies of two bishops. When St. John was about to be laid beside them, their corpses moved apart from one another as though they were alive, thus leaving a place between themselves for John's remains. The mourners beheld this marvel with their own eyes and overcome with amazement glorified God. It is not fitting for us to remain silent concerning the following miracle which took place from the, after the saint's burial. A woman fell into a grave sin and because of her shame could not bring herself to confess it before her spiritual father. Instead, she went in faith to St. John who was still alive but was already ailing and near death. She fell at the saint's feet shedding copious tears and cried out to him, O most blessed one, I am a stranger in this land and have fallen into a sin so grievous that I can tell no man of it. But I know that if you wish, you can forgive me. For the Lord said, Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. The blessed one replied to the woman, If you have come with faith to confess your sin before me. The woman said, I cannot confess it, master. Shame prevents me. The godly one said to her, If shame prevents you from confessing it with your lips, then write it down on a sheet of paper and bring it to me. She answered, Neither can I do this. Then write out your sin, seal the paper, and bring it to me. The saint said to her. The woman wrote down her sin, but she enjoined John neither to open the paper nor to read what she had written. John took the sheet of paper and five days later reposed without having told anyone of it. The woman was not in the city at the time of his death, but returned the day after his burial. Learning that the patriarch had died and was buried, she began to lament, thinking that someone would have taken the paper and read what she had written. 
she went to the saint's grave and began to cry out to him as though he were alive, saying, O man of God, I did not dare confess my sin to thee, and lo, now I stand condemned by all. How I wish I had never given thee the sheet of paper. Woe is me, the wretched one. I wish to escape my shame, but now a worse shame doth beset me, and I will become a laughing stock to all. I have been wounded at the very place where I hope to receive healing. But I will not depart from thy grave, O favorite of God, until thou tellest me where it was thou didst leave the paper I entrusted to thee, for I know that thou art not dead, but livest. The woman continued to cry out thus for three days at John's grave. On the third night, St. John came forth from his grave with the two bishops who lay beside him and appeared to the weeping woman. He said to her, Woman, why do you not leave us in peace? Why do you persist in wetting our vestments with your tears? After saying this, John gave the woman the sheet of paper, still sealed, and said, Take what you have written, open it, and look at it. The reposed bishops then returned to their graves. Meanwhile, the woman saw that the seal on the paper still remained unbroken. When she opened it, she found that what she had written had disappeared. In its place was written, This sin has been blotted out for the sake of John, my servant. The woman rejoiced greatly because her sin had been miraculously remitted and returned home glorifying and praising God and magnifying his favorite, St. John the Merciful. May the Lord likewise show mercy on us by the saints' prayers, blot out our sins, and write our names in the book of life eternal. Amen. Through the prayers of our holy St. John the Merciful, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.